Hi, I'm Sam, and I'm on Mech with Doc Ross with Benjamin Garcia. Sam, thank you very much for coming. It's an absolute honor to have you here. How are you feeling today? A little bit tired. A little bit tired? Yeah. You, you drove all the way from Placencia yourself? Placencia, yeah. No driver? No, no, no driver yet. I see, I see. I, I mean, I feel like famous people sometimes have drivers, <laughs> you know, and, and you don't do any driving. You just kind of sleep on the road. Oh, no, no. I feel like um, the highwayman lifestyle is a big part of my brand anyway, so... Today, um, Sam, to be honest with you, I don't know a lot about you. I've, I've done my stalking. Uh, you radiate a very different energy from a lot of people uh, based on what I've seen on social media. But I want to know, who are you? Who am I? That's a, that's a really big question. Um, I definitely, you know, I think my, my vlogs in particular, they do this really careful balance of sharing parts of my life while still keeping absolutely everything private which i think is something that i'm really proud of about the way i do it so i'm, I'm glad that you stalked me and felt like you because <laughs> that's what i'm going for on a certain degree both um from a stylistic point of view and also just for safety yeah I've, i mean i've seen your your stories and and everything is very like aesthetic and you know everything looks cool and 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 people people almost never knows where you're at because i saw one of your tiktoks and in the tiktok you said i think you were at the at the airport was it or I leaving or coming something about but it wasn't belizean related i think it was like traveling right i i haven't done that many where i've been traveling out of the country but i do i do post about traveling outside but of then the and i know if you have actually in belize you know like it's it, if you don't know where you're really at then you can't really follow where samantha is at well that's i mean that's for a variety of purposes uh, to be honest with you i had a stalker for several years um, so it's just a privacy element is sometimes I notice, um, if I'm not too careful about it and I post like, Hey, I'm here. It's not going to be a lot of people like, you know, my platform isn't enormous, but one or two like accounts that I don't recognize and that, you know, don't have any, like, you think Diana, Diana crazy X? I, I don't know, maybe, um, but they'll comment. They'll be like, nice to see you in San Ignacio. And I'll be like, okay. And I go in the profile and there's no photos. They follow me. I don't know who they are. And it's, I, it's not to say that I don't appreciate the people who like are happy to see me and like my account, but that's part of the reason why I'm kind of delay, you know, my storylines. And like, if I traveled like two months ago, then I'll post about it now because I don't want to. Yeah. You know? And, and how, how do you feel though? Like you have to a certain extent, you know, having um, your follower support is one thing, but people that don't even follow you, stalking you, answering to your, to your stories is another thing. That's totally different. I mean, I, I'd be weird, it, honestly. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, so the stalker situation was a very particular human being who I um, unfortunately had um, interactions with because of, I used to work at PETA. I used to be vegan, and I used to work at people for the ethical treatment of animals. And I, it's, it's a really long story. It's a really funny story, but it ends with her calling me and threatening my life for like three years. <laughs> really? <laughs> and like using voice modulators. That crazy, you know, that crazy. Where, where, is she in Belize though? No, this wasn't Belize. This wasn't Belize. And so when I came to Belize and I started developing a platform after having that experience in the U.S. where I didn't even really have a platform at that point, I was kind of weary of, you know, like how much to share because like I know yeah. I had that experience. I'm like, like I've personally, my platform isn't, uh, prob my platform is half the size year one. Your platform is significantly larger than mine. I don't know what you're talking uh, TikTok? Instagram, right? well, I, well, TikTok is different because I don't really share my personal stuff there like i don't even share where i'm at on tiktok yeah. like when i post a video that's it but like instagram i'd post what i'm doing lifestyle stuff and and it, it changes everything because then it's like you have an inside look uh, you know into my life yeah. um i've never posted a single picture of my mom and my dad in there and i would never mm -hmm. um after i started tiktok i realized that a lot of strange faces started following me well not following me, but sending friend requests on on facebook I don't know them and I have nothing against that. It's social media. It's about interacting with people you don't know, making new friends. But I don't feel like allowing them to know my family. I don't feel like allowing them to know my background. Um, I live in San Ignacio for about six, seven years now. And nobody really knows me. You only know what I tell you. You only know what you see on social media. You don't know where I come from. You don't know who's my dad, who's my mom, who's my sisters. You don't know absolutely anything about my background. So I know where you're coming from, but for a lady, it's different.
Because for a guy, if anybody messages me, hey, nice to see you in San Ignacio, I'd be like, thank you. But for a lady, it's like, ah, oh, shit, you know, somebody, yeah. they, they, they stalk you. And he was not necessarily stalking, and I didn't take that message that way necessarily. If the person who commented it ends up seeing this, I'm not saying that like you're a creep. It's just that it's the that kind of you you have that thought. Like the first yeah. thought is like, is this dangerous, or is this just somebody who you know like doesn't post on TikTok and is interested in my content? Um, so that's part of why there's a little bit of mystery. But then the other part is that it's just fun. To that's good. That's good. <laughs> well, I've done I've done enough t- um, stalking, not from before even before i i invited you over to to the podcast um i saw you posted once that you come from well your last name comes from a judge yes um my grandfather was um a supreme court he was the the the, the chief justice of the supreme court up until he passed um i think it was in the late 90s late 90s okay so what kind of shots did he call back then he um, was, um, I rec- if I recall correctly, he was responsible for, there's a very famous case of a woman who, um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was the first woman and the last hanging in, in Belize. And she, it's a very intense story. She, um, she you can share it, no worries. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, her husband had been cheating on her and abusing her. And so she got sick and tired of it one day and she chained up the outhouse while he was inside the outhouse and doused it in kerosene and lit it on fire. So um, my grandfather was responsible for that verdict. He tried that case. So he was the one who said, hung her. Yes. Technically. Technically, yes. Damn. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you a story. One of her sons was my teacher. No. Yeah. Everything is connected. So everything was, now that when you said that, and I read that part, and I was like, and I know it has nothing to do with you, <laughs> right? So it's not like that's any of your fault. Yeah. Um, it's very unfortunate. And I know that they are, um, there were updates made very recently about that case. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, they were. I think she was, um, she was found innocent or something like that. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, there were a lot of theories about it whereby they said, well, yes, he was he was um, soaked with kerosene, but he was the one who lit his own cigarette. Cigarette. I, I, you know, I vaguely remember that story from hearing versions of it when I was, yeah. when I was a child. But. Listening to it and hearing, I'm a feminist. I believe in woman empowering. I believe in women can rule the world to a certain extent, of course. I, I think there are certain things that men still need to take care of, not women, but. Um, when I heard that story and learning that it was because she was being abused, cheated on, and all these things hurt me because, like, she was just defending herself. Now, the man, there's always two sides to a story, um, probably had a different story. We don't know, and we might just never know because, you know, he's dead. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I think it's, it was also, it's, it's a really interesting case to talk about, to be honest, in terms of um, feminism and equality, because I, I think the reason why it was a big deal at the time was because it was the first woman who that had ever happened to. We never tried women in the same way that we tried men. So she was held up to the same, you know, sort of system that men were. So on one hand, it feels like, you know, a sort of, um, what's the woman on the coin in the U.S.? Um, the woman on a coin. There's a woman on a coin in the U.S. that they celebrate because she fought to be put in prison alongside men. Uh, she she did something wrong, and they were like, "We're not going to try you because you're a woman." And she's like, "No, try me, and try me as a man because I broke the law and I believe in equality. So I should I should be tried in the same way." Um, and so she celebrated as a feminist icon. So you could see it from that way. Although the woman, I don't know if she requested to be, um, you know, the woman in Belize. I don't know if she requested to be. Right, as a man. I don't, I don't I think so. Have, I don't I think so. That, that, would be, that would be very crazy. I mean, especially knowing that that might have been the end of her, you know. Well, yeah. it ended up being the end of her. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think so. Um, talking about equal rights and, and feminism, I know you ran up for Miss Universe Belize. Um, I questioned how did it work out for you? Because if, let's say, you smoke marijuana and you post it up, how did that affect your, your pageant? Well, I I was second runner up, so I'm still under contract. Um, uh, but I I mean they were really cool about it. To be honest with you, um, I think that this current like Miss Universe Belize leadership is they're really open and 
because there would be questions about marijuana legalization on the docket, there didn't really seem like there was much issue with it. I remember there was a point where we had recommendations on what posts to take down that we had, and they had said previously, like, don't take it down, you take down anything, you know, that might just not be like, you, you have to think of yourself as a Disney princess, you know, it's not an insult to your character or anything. It's just that you are now potentially going to become a, a Disney princess that little girls look up to. It's not, this isn't for adult consumption only. It's a real life Disney princess is the way that I, I consistently thought about it. So while I, and there was no um, singling out, like you should do this and you should do this. They're just like, think about it. And so when I thought about it, I mean, I don't think that there's anything wrong with smoking for adults, but if you're creating yourself as a role model or, you know, somebody positioning themselves as hoping to become a role model that might be viewed by children, and you know that that's the position you're pursuing, you just need to, you know, PG-13 it down a little bit. And since then, I have, um, I, have I think, toned down how much I post about marijuana. Um, I don't necessarily know if it needs to consistently come from my personal profile anyways. Um, I think there was a point in my life where it was a really large part of my personality. And I think that might have been the part that I moved away from a little bit, but I, do, I still definitely pro-legalization. Um, I did start legalized Belize. So um, big, I mean, and that's a human rights issue outside of um, whether or not you smoke. You know, you don't have to smoke to agree that adults are within so you do well i mean i'm I'm glad you you support the legalization of marijuana because i personally support the legalization of marijuana um question to you how were tattoos dealt with with the miss universe belize rules and and what's that i noticed you have some tattoos in on your hand oh yeah i have quite a few honestly i have like some pretty big ones i have a giant pineapple right here and so i have some the small ones are really easy to address and i think that's something that um other contestants had dealt with before because you know most y'all have like one or two small tattoos but i have these big ones um and then like what you want bigger one like oh yeah mm. and, like, oh. so um i mean they're sporadic they're not like um like body wrap tattoos so they're easy to cover but not with regular makeup i had to order a particular kind of makeup that's intended to cover tattoos um and it was still a lot of layers of that and when it came to the photo shoots I actually noticed it seemed like maybe it wasn't something they thought about. But again, I'm thinking about branding myself as a princess. So I asked the photographer, I was like, can you please photograph Question. my... Can princesses friend? have tattoos? They definitely can. They definitely can. And I think we're moving more closely towards that. But I, I have a history in marketing, you know, and that's like where I worked for a really long time before I decided that it was so less and I didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but so I understand that, like, especially like, and I, I'm sure you can relate, is that once you become a public figure, you are a product. You're not a person. Um, and Belize barely had a princess, you know, like we don't have those, we don't have, we have, I love Iris is like one of the most beautiful people I've ever met. And I think she's a great role model, but we don't have that many people like that, that are Belizean and that are doing that. And so I, I, you have to walk before you can run, you know, like maybe we should have a couple princesses before we have the added princess. But at the same time, I, it, it goes both ways. It was, it was personal preference. And at the end of the day, it was a competition. Um, and the choice that I made was that I wanted to do my best to win um, instead of make a point. So um, covering the tattoos was actually my choice. They, nobody asked me to. Um, nobody told me to. I just looked at, you know, the competition. And I looked at who typically wins. And I, I treated it very much like a sport. You know, it, it was about just being the best contestant that you can be so that so that you win as opposed to feeling the need to really like completely show every part of myself because if I gain the platform, then I can really do whatever I want with it, you know? But it was election mode. You, you're, you're kind of, um, you want to propose like the best, most family-friendly version of yourself and then you can start to introduce the more, more you know, you think about it like a politician, you can introduce the more, um, the more edgy or like the less upfront values and things more controversial yeah. things once you have the platform but to gain it you kind of have to just do whatever you need to do what was your your favorite thing about being part of miss universe belize it was by far the just female energy and the sisterhood that i felt because i growing up i always had like one like really close like female friend but i never had like a group i never had that experience of like all of the energy around you and so I actually joined a sorority in college because of that but it still didn't state that need um, and I think part of it is because it was a sorority in college in the United States so even so it was a community of women but not women that had the exact 
you know, experience that I did or even anything close. So definitely just the female community and like being able to enjoy that sort of energy and just supportive women who want to support each other and see you succeed. The coaches in particular that we had House of Crowns, they were just absolutely fantastic. And it, it felt like it felt like what I hoped my sorority felt like, to be honest with you. So what about the worst part of being in Miss Universe Belize? So the people who felt the need to be like, so and so did this and you know like this gal better than this gal and oh look at this picture oh this one particular gal looked bad while the rest looked good it was just so unnecessary and it made it really difficult because <clears throat> it, it's not even how we were acting and it, it, it felt like a lot of people were projecting their own personal biases onto us thinking that we were behaving a certain way i had several people after the victory um who messaged me and said that i didn't seem happy enough on stage for the winner um, and they took personal offense with that. Yeah, fuck that, people. <laughs> it's just so crazy because it's like I am, I'm like staring at lights. I don't even see you guys. And um, they just passed me a bouquet. I'm still processing what happened. I'm just, and I, 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 they didn't train you on what to do, you know, when somebody wins. So we didn't even have that practice. And to get off stage and then see like several messages from somebody angry saying like, yeah, and you were like laughing when, oh. and I was like, no, like I was, I was terrified. Like I had like a, I had this like tattooed smile on my face while I'm like walking around in a swimsuit on stage. And you're trying to tell me that I'm up here trying to be mean. Yeah. There are people, there are people need to jump on stage and, and try it themselves so that they, they, that they know, because I mean, to be honest with you, um, being an outsider and a, and a huge fan of what really happened, you know, throughout the entire pageant, um, I did see a lot of not just that, but when when Ashley won and 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 and, and the supporters Alina had and and the, the comments that I saw flooding on social media, uh, saying, "Oh, Alina, should I win? Alina, should I win?" and and Alina was dealt with that situation like what G, like what boss, because I saw her post and she was very very uh, much supportive of Ashley winning and 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 that sisterhood, like you said, but. People like us, where they outside, we don't know, and we can't judge. Be like me personally, I am just happy with whoever won because you know I knew I knew all of you girls, and it, it felt a little bit more personal because you know I didn't know you per se like that, but I had met you before in at, at Placencia, remember the Labsa Fest, mm -hmm. um, and I had you on social media. Alina, well, I I know she for a time, um, you know, Radisson days, and and we had um Kenny, you know, so it it was different for me. But people in know no no no, and just say well. I was support Alina, or I was support Sam, or I was support Ashley. You know, it, 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 it. They were the ones who created those crazy scenarios. But you know what? It's usually the case. It is. It is. But I mean, at the end, it makes sense. You know, I, and you have to take a step away and realize where people are coming from. Even though the energy that they come with isn't the best. At, at the end of the day, the, the reason why people were acting like that were the people who didn't know any of us and supported, say, me or 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 supported, um, supported Alina or supported Ashley, it's because they saw themselves in that person and it was about representation for them. So when Alina didn't win, it, it felt like they were being told that, you know, the person that they see themselves in is not the winner, so I'm not the winner. And I think it was the same thing with Ashley, that they, they felt like you're saying she doesn't deserve the win, that means that you're saying I wouldn't deserve something. And that's what we are. Uh, like I said, like we're creating, we're Disney princesses, we're creating a product and we do, no one person can represent everything. And I, I think that this, this Miss Universe was, believes really was heavily about representation and that's why it got so chaotic at the end. But I think everybody dealt with it in the best way that they could. And I, I'm glad that we, we had somebody amazing representing us. No, honestly, yeah. I, you guys did a, a wonderful job. I don't know. I don't know. Did a, a good job. Social media was everything on the stage. Um, like I said, it's just the general public where always they make up madaras and and say things on on social media. But in the end, you know, I've I've been following up with Ashley and everything she's been doing and and you know being the Miss Universe Belize and, and representing us and, and she's been doing a, a wonderful job so kudos to her for that and she's actually going to be on the podcast sometime oh, soon is. yeah, yeah so uh, I'll have all of you all of you uh, um, uh, what's her name the, the girl that went over to Guatemala I forgot her Sigourney? name I, I can't pronounce it Sigourney 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 yeah okay Sigourney, if you're listening, my apologies. I can't pronounce your name, but um, so I'll see if we can get her as well uh, as well on the podcast because I think people need to know from you personally. This is an 
you know, a, a, an inside look in what really happened, an inside look of Samantha and, and, and really what revolved around that entire um, pageant. And, and you're right. I think that was that was one of the nastiest things I I saw on social media. You know, people say, oh, that this person should be a winner, that person. But the thing about competition is I mean, one of the most important things, and I think this was uh, the main post that I made about this, and I think a couple of people took that the wrong way, that I didn't have, like, an essay <laughs> attached to my post for it, but that's just not how... I think we already talked about that. That's not how I share yeah. um, things on social media. But but that is what I said, is that the most important thing is to win gracefully. I mean, to lose gracefully. And when you enter into the competition, you have to know that there can only be one winner. That doesn't mean that you are any less in any other way than the other person, and it doesn't even mean that you're any less than that person in this circumstance. It meant that they showed up better than you did for this particular thing. And if, if you're in a, you know, like a, fo- a, a football game or something and the team beats you, it's not because, you know, like they hate people who look like the Patriots. And because, it's because the Patriots did a better job and they, they, they took home the game. And that, yeah. that's how I felt at the end was I looked at it and I saw how well Ashley had done with her walk. You could tell how prepared she was. And instead of looking at that and being like, I'm wounded because the universe took this victory away from me, you look at your competition that beat you and you, you look at what they did better than you and you use that as a way to improve. Yeah. Um, and I mean, granted, viewers can't do that. Um, viewers can just pick their favorite and then like, it's, you know, the difference between the I think it's, that's their job though. Yeah. That's their job. That's their job. It's I think the they're entitled to do that. Soccer hooligans versus the soccer players, you know? Yeah, honestly, um, Samantha, I, I think, I think fa- fast forward to know after that pageant, people start and understand what really happened and how things get done and what's not you know i did see the posts and to be honest with you i've i've worked with 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 females a lot like at my job site and it's chaotic like at a teller every single day somebody moody somebody begs or then they argue with each other so the fact that you said you know it was a sisterhood and you know me you know me you know like for each other it speaks a lot and, and about what you guys stand for. And outside, no, you said you're still under contract with Miss Universe Belize, right? Yes, um, because I was first, second runner-up. I, I, I loaned it to say like third runner-up because I don't understand the system, but it's second runner-up. Second runner-up. Because I was second runner-up, I am, I'm, I'm still under contract until next year. Um, in case of a Buddy Holly-style plane crash, we're both Alina and... God forbid. Right? God forbid. Yeah. God forbid. But I think that that's what that means is that I would, I would, I would, I would take the crown. Are there certain things you can't do? Um, right now? There, I no, not. I mean, I can't. I, but it's not that I want to. So it's not really a difficulty. But I can't disparage the organization essentially. But I don't have anything. Negative you can't what? Sorry. I can't disparage the organization. Oh. But I have nothing negative to say. So I, I don't think that that would be a problem. Um, there's a lot more rules once you actually take on the crown because, as I said, you're a professional princess. Um, but at, at this point, yeah, I can't. I, I would never want to, but I, I cannot disparage the organization. And I am also not allowed to compete with any other pageants. I did want to go up for Earth this year, actually. Um, but up until the new Miss Universe is selected, I'm still under contract, so I, I can't do Earth. Though I do hope to do Earth next year. You should. You should. I think. I think, to me, if you ask me, I think that is more your your aura, your environment, what you can like get into, you know, like that's what I get from you on, on social media in general. Um, you're always surrounded by nature. Most of your videos include nature. Uh, it's about lifestyle and, and I think to me, you know, just, that's just how I see it. I think it, it, it would be better. Um, who's the, the current Miss Earth? It's, um, oh, I'm spacing on her name. She's a lovely, lovely girl. I think I have her. I've, well, I follow her on Instagram. Um, Simone or Simone? Simone. 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 I can't. I'm not. I'm not trying to pronounce her name. Apologies, Simone. Um, Simone Salou. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's wonderful. She's a great pick. Um, she similarly. Um, I love her content. She's no. She's very. Nature. She's very nice. She's very into conservation. She's yeah. always in the water. So I really, I really love her. She's from content. Key Cocker, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Simone. I met her here in San Ignacio the other day, and she was pretty, pretty nice. Like it didn't even feel like, like I was meeting. I don't know, like, I didn't feel nervous, per se. You know, like, you usually get a well, different vibe because you're the meets up, a well, public figure, you know. Um, and I, I didn't feel that. She just was herself, and she was just cool, you know, about everything. Um, so I think she's, uh, she's doing a good job there. Yeah, she's a great pick. I think, um, and I think that's, like you said, I agree um, that uh, Earth is a bit more on my brand. 
And I had initially planned to go up for Earth. Earth was the first one that I had. Imagine you run up for Miss Earth. You win. Uh, boom, the legalized marijuana. <laughs> That would be the ideal story. That would be. I mean, that's and that's the thing that um, when it comes to Miss Earth, um, the the um, the charity that you pick, the um, the cause that you're supporting, it's always environmental. So I I had so many ideas for what the cause would have been. I'm really happy with the cause that I selected for Miss Universe Belize, but I, I agree with you. I do tend to gravitate a little bit yeah. more towards the nature based stuff. So I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be fun. And I seeing Simone's content about um, being over there was just amazing because um, I noticed they had the girls going out and just planting trees. Like it, it's such a and, and I loved the experience of Miss Universe of us like doing the very high femme things. And, you know, like we were going out to eat all the time, but just the idea of going and planting a, a tree as a part of the pageant is it's so totally different, yeah, right? That was totally the, different. The energy. Uh, totally different thing, and and I think you you would have definitely fit there. Oh, thank you, thank you. I hope so. Travelers Liquors, home to Belize's favorite rums. Available countrywide, we have all our products in miniature sizes, so you can always take a piece of Belize with you wherever you go. Enjoy our wide array of aged rum, one barrel, three barrel, five barrel, and even tropical brandy. Locally produced wine and spirits. And for all our liqueur lovers, we've got you covered as they're also available countrywide. Gold and white rums for your favorite drinks. And last but not least, vintage rum lovers, we have Tibur rum, Belizean rum, and the famous Dono Mario. We invite you to visit us at our Belize City location at 2.5 miles Philip Goldson Highway or in San Pedro at number 15 Pescador Drive. We extend a cordial invitation for you to share in our unique journey of rum making history at the Travelers Heritage Museum. Book your tour today. So I know you're also a judge for Glazed Out. Um, I, I love that show. I always follow where Sean do. Sean Cree is a bad. Sean is hilarious. <laughs> Sean is um, but he's he's a good he's a good um, TV host um, and, and and everything. But in your case, you're the judge, so you get to call the shots who to get points and who would, who basically a win. How is that? It's a it's it's a lot of pressure, you know, and it's because you can see how much energy the chefs put into the work. Um, and so you never want to send anybody home. And you know, with any show with a panel of judges, everybody gets their own personality that, the, you know, that archetypical, like the Simon Cowell and the, so I am lucky that I ended up getting to be the nice one. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> so I'm typically, I mean, um, the main critique you get from me is cleanliness. Like if the food tastes good, the food tastes good. Um, but it's super fun. It's super fun. We get to try so much food. That was the only thing is that when we're filming, by the end of the day, you're like swollen. Super swollen. And you just want to lay down. And like you don't think that eating like that much rich food would be like exhausting. But like I had a friend who was making fun of me. He was like, he's like, oh, like you're like tired from from eating like, like, you know, like all that fancy food all day. I'm like, yes, actually. <laughs> yes, actually. So who's the Simon Cowell in, 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 in the glazed out judge? Wolfgang. Wolfgang, Wolfgang. I, I I figured I figured, and it's crazy because I can't I can't bring myself to see him as that because I know him, nice and he's so nice he's so because nice. like Wolfgang look, Wolfgang is super nice and Miss Anushka is super nice as well. Um, his wife, um, I know Eva as well, and I met her in in San Pedro. Um, she legit me jump on stage and dance by the Marco. I have a video of that. I need to see that video. I'll show you. Like, I need see to the grind on the man and all that kind of thing on the stage. She don't give a fuck. You never tell me. You never tell me. And then there's you, so I can't quite see none of you um, being mean, you know, per se. But um, did the TNC tell you, well, you're going to be a Miss Nice Girl, you're going to be the mean one, and you're going to be like in between? Kind of. I mean, not to spoil the movie Magic or anything, guys, um, but we're all very nice. <laughs> to be yeah. Honest. Wolfgang is a sweetheart, but I think he got pigeonholed that way because he has that accent, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. And it, it works for TV. It works for TV. Yeah, everybody, yeah. much like, you know, like, like Miss Universe, everybody likes each other behind the camera. Um, and uh, going back to the glazed out and, and you being a judge, how did you become a judge? Like, that means you know about food. Yes. Yes. So, um... Honestly, I've known Chef Sean for quite some time, and um, I've always had a love of food. Um, I, I think one of my first media appearances would have been when I was like six or seven. Um, old heads might remember Chef Rob's cooking show. 
Um, oh, that yeah. he used to film at Radisson. And yes. um, he's a very close family friend and I love him and he might have been my inspiration behind this, but I am a classically trained chef. Um, I was on that show with him as a little kid and I think it really stuck with me that I, I really enjoyed it. Um, he let me be his assistant, so I was cracking eggs. And cool. It was really cool. So I think that might have been, that might be why I do what I do now, you know, but I am a classically trained chef and I'm opening a restaurant Cool. Um, in, in Placencia, but... The way I actually got to be on Glazed Out was Sean knows that I am a classically trained chef and the first season of Glazed Out um, wasn't a competition. It was a sort of showcase of different, not just chefs, um, but like media personalities, like cooking something with Sean that they really enjoyed. And what I made for him was a dish that I had when I used to live in Paris that was, it's called a pork knuckle. And it's about like this big, it's like as big as your head. And, um, the place Wait, my head not that big, Summer. It's big, it's big. <laughs> like, it's big. As big, as big as your head. <laughs> because it's like the pork knee, right? Uh, but I would, when I lived in Paris, I would get it all the time because they cook it the same. Maybe they don't cook it the same way, but the way it tastes is just like pigtail. Like the best, you know, the pink part, that pigtail, hmm. that immense part. And so I would go and have it whenever I was homesick and they serve it with French fries. And it's just a nice, like juicy fat and the, like nice pink meat. So that's what I made for him. And I basically got the pork knuckle and I brined it for like six days and then I cooked it the way that we would cook pigtail. Nice. And it was amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. But Sean, me love it? He loved it. He loved it. Good. And I think me and Sean share our values about food a lot because he's really passionate about using you know. local ingredients, not using anything imported, which is something that I, I plan to do at my restaurant as well because it's a really big passion of mine. We have such great food here. Everything yeah. is naturally organic because we just use their pesticides. And we have, like, fruit that people pay a lot of money to import places, but instead, like, people want to go buy the packaged cherries and strawberries because it feels fancy. But what they don't understand is that, like, in Los Angeles and New York, people pay so much money for the kind of produce that we we get for pennies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, bananas, for example, don't so... I, I remember growing up and we just get a bunch of bananas for free. Um just, you know, people just go work and bring Wally two bunch of banana home. You know, the banana farms and hungs out. And, and so I would take advantage of it. Fast forward to now, I wish I had that. Some days I wish I could just cook those meals my mom would make, you know, with those bananas and, and, and relive that um, all over again. Talking about the restaurant, what is it going to, what, what's its name? It's called Shade Wellness. Shade Wellness. Yeah, the concept is um. So it, calling it a restaurant is whenever I have to talk about it, it gets like really like large because the best way to explain it is um, is sort of like an Italy. If you've ever been to an Italy in the in the United States, viewers, um, it's um, Aule, Aule gana Melcher, Yeah, <laughs> it's um, but it's um a gourmet grocery that has an attached cafe that produces food sourced like using the ingredients from the organic cafe. So. We're going to have really like um, like local products that we package ourselves, but package properly because it's a huge problem I have with the Belizean food industry is we have great ingredients, but we don't know how to package it. So you like go home with your paca meat and like it on like <laughs> half open and that kind of thing. So we're going to be selling like um, interesting cuts and game meat that we want to buy directly from hunters and fresh caught fish that's packaged really great. But then the restaurant itself is going to be kind of like a European style bistro. Where you do plan to have gib, gib nut there? Yes. Oh, for real? Yes. Is it not illegal, though? If it's illegal, then I don't plan to have it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think so. I think there's a season, right? I don't know, you know, like, listen, uh, I think if, if it is illegal, I don't care, but I eat it. I eat <laughs> gibna. You ever try what gibna, like rice and beans with gibna? That's like the nicest like, shit ever. I make this amazing stew gibna for um, Ooh, Christmas dinner. You see? Yeah. But I think it is illegal. I think. Well, then my granny never make what delicious. Yeah, and I never buy no <laughs> rice and beans to give that. But I'm glad that you are opening a, a restaurant. You know, Placencia has, has commercialized so much um, in these past years. You know, I'm originally from Mango Creek. And I remember clearly um, going to Placencia and it was more residential. And then slowly it, it, it changed into the tourist um, destination that it is now. Unfortunately, people started selling their houses and, and, their, and their lots and, and what's not, you know. But it's still good for the economy. And those same people are the ones working in Placencia. So I'm glad that you're you're opening your restaurant. I hope I get invited for the launch. Of if course. there is going to be one, yes. I'll I'll be there for sure. Um so yeah, for everyone that's that's listening at home or where, wherever they're at, you know, they're they're cordially invited. Do you have um a projected date so far? 
We have our soft opening planned for the end of the month, so 29th of February. February 29th. And we are located right directly beside the airport, so you really can't miss us. It's the oh. beautiful building you saw going up for the past three years. We finally finished it, and there's a restaurant inside. Nice, nice, mm. nice. So that's the by the Tropicare, right? Tropicare yes. and Maya, the right name. So right before, if you're coming from um, out of out of Placentia, like down the peninsula, then it'll be on your right side right before you see the airport. Cool, cool, cool. Um, you, do you have an Instagram account or a Facebook account for it already? We do. It's um, Shade Wellness. Just okay. at Shade Wellness. At Shade Wellness. Cool. On your Instagram, what, what is it? It's at the sea itself. The sea itself. Yes. What about the sea, though? Like, it's, uh, So that's actually, um, that's an excerpt from a favorite quote of mine, from a favorite book of mine. It's, um, it's called The Incantation of Frida Kay by Kate Braverman. And I used to have the quote memorized, but I really I'd like to read it for you guys. So let me see if I can find it. I love quotes. Um, I personally don't. I personally sorry don't read, but every time someone shares a quote, and sometimes without understanding the the context or subtext of it, um, the quote itself makes a lot of sense. And that's what I like about quotes in general. You don't have to know a lot of reading, but you know where it's coming from and where it's going. So, um, it can always be relatable and and resound with you. Um, is it a, a lifestyle quote or is it like love or it's um so the, the the book itself is about um it's a poetic retelling of Frida Kahlo's life told from the perspective of her deathbed which is really gory I can't seem to find it but it goes some somewhere along the lines of um I am a water woman not a vessel not something that you can sail or charter I am instead the river the tributary the fluid source and the sea itself I am all of her rainy implications. And what do you, with your rusted compass, know of love? Sick. Sick. That, 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 that song, Badass. I, I, like I tell <laughs> her, I don't, I don't read none at all. Um, but that, that, that sounds like something you, like girls, I mean, women in general. And I said earlier, I'm a feminist and I believe in women empowering. So whatever makes you feel better, I'm all for it. Talking about women empowering, do you believe that women and men should have equal rights? I do. I do believe women and men should have equal rights. I have a mixed relationship with the term feminist, but I think it's just a, a bit about the way it's being. I think American feminism just really weirds me out because it, it prioritizes things that just aren't important to people who live in countries like ours. And then it puts that to the forefront. And that's kind of become what that word means in many places. So I'm a what does feminism mean to you? To me, um, I mean, equality. And it's, it's, a, it's a focus on where the focus needs to be put. And I, I personally would rather put my focus assisting, for example, the 12 year old girls that are forced into essentially slavery in um, fast fashion factories, just bleeding fingers, making clothing, as opposed to um, the kind of topics that we cover. Like, oh, like, oh, this celebrity was, you know, somebody insulted the celebrity's appearance and this is a feminist issue. I. Maybe it is, maybe it is, but it's just not where I am willing to put my attention. When it comes to celebrities, to be honest, and, and, and that whole feminism thing, I just feel like they were a bag of shit. Because to, to a certain extent, like you mentioned earlier, when you become a public figure, you're no longer yourself. You're a product. And you as a product should expect that criticism from people. Because even if you buy, um, I, I don't want to I don't wanna promote any product, but um, let's say, for example, you buy... The same product from two different brands, for example. You will criticize one because, oh, you like this this chocolate more than the next one, for example. Uh, how should I say, like, you, you should expect it as a, as a public figure. You know, it comes with it. But people that have real life problems, like the man where to beat up the woman and you know, no one makes you go work or she just has to stay home and mind kids and you know they allow she. Listen, if that's her choice, cool. So that's my feminism. My feminism is concerned with that over the sort of identity politics that I think we've yeah. been focusing on a lot globally, which that might be a little bit of a controversial opinion. But um, it's, it's a common issue that I think um, a lot of women who have experience with the feminist movement, I, I, I think, come to. I know a lot of black women don't like the movement because it focuses on, on white women Primarily, um, the whole pussy hat thing that was going on. Pussy hat, while, where they were knitting pussy hats and like it was, it was like don't grab my pussy and doing Donald Trump. But it's just it's such pop culture feminism, and I think that's what I have a problem with. Where it's like the t-shirts <laughs> that say like feminista. Yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah. It's like it becomes more of like a a personality type, a brand, a virtue signal, than an actual movement to assist 
the women who actually need it. Right. Because the women who actually need it, I mean, I'm, I'm not, not to say there aren't problems in America. I, they have enough money to deal with it on their own. So that's kind of like none of my business. But if you're, so if you, if you actually want to like affect change, I don't know, I, I would, it, equity over equality, you know, like bringing the rest of the women and the rest of the world up to the point that we have reached in the developed world seems like a higher priority than. I'm glad you, you said that. I'm glad you said yeah. equity over equality because that's a topic that not a lot of people know how to discuss or they won't understand the difference between equity and equality. And everyone is just so um, into the equality thing. And I'll be honest with you. I just think that some ladies are OK being submissive. And they're okay staying at choice. home. It's and it's a choice. And if, yeah. if, if that's what you want to do, then I should respect that. Who am I to say, oh, well, you have equal rights and you should go to work and, 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 and make money for yourself and empower yourself. If you don't want to do that, then guess what? That's on you. This girl boss mentality, though, that's something that we, I think is the early 2000s. And I'm really glad that Gen Z seems like they're moving away from it because, you know, the whole like trad life trend. Yeah. I'm super pro trad life. I, I would love to go run away to a cottage and just be cared for and milk some cows while my husband chops down trees. Like that's ideal life. I would <laughs> listen. <laughs> Travelers Liquors, home to Belize's favorite rums. Available countrywide, we have all our products in miniature sizes, so you can always take a piece of Belize with you wherever you go. Enjoy our wide array of aged rums, one barrel, three barrel, five barrel, and even tropical brandy. Locally produced wine and spirits. And for all our liqueur lovers, we've got you covered as they're also available countrywide. Gold and white rums for your favorite drinks. And last but not least, vintage rum lovers, we have people on rum, Belize and rum, and the famous Don Mario. We invite you to visit us at our Belize City location at 2.5 miles Philip Goldson Highway or in San Pedro at number 15 Pescador Drive. We extend a cordial invitation for you to share in our unique journey of rum making history at the Travelers Heritage Museum. Book your tour today. So Ben, you read much? To be honest with you, I I've only read one book in my entire life. It's the Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I think everybody <laughs> I think everybody read that book. So and and the first um, reading that I had to do back in primary school and, and high school. But otherwise, I know I'm not really into reading. I watch more. Though? I'm more a visual guy. I watch videos. Diary of a Wimpy Kid's a classic though. Classic yeah, yeah, classic and and then they have like respect. like so many um. Level, not level, sorry, um, editions. So. Oh, so you read the whole series? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, well, that's not just one book. That's a series of books. That's, that's, that's Well, that, that, no that, book, you know, no based book, on yeah. one, on, on one. And then there's um, um, Green Days by the River, which is a novel that you that I read back in, in high school. I was in second form, and my literature teacher used to have us reading that book. Really, really good book. Um, it was, I think the, the, the book was a Trinidadian book. Okay. Of a Trinidad, I think. Um, I went to Kyle Christian Academy in, in Ontario. And um, that's the book that, that we had to read. They, they speak about, it's a love story, actually. And it speaks about this dude that works. And they don't call machets. Machet, they call it a cutlass. Okay. Yeah, I, I had never heard that before. And then when I hear it, they're like, hmm, that's, that's interesting. But that's as much as I read. Um, how about you? <laughs> Well, I like I love that what you mentioned as a Trinidadian writer because I'm I'm really I, I'm a writer myself. I know I, I don't say I'm a chef and I, I do too much, but uh, my my true passion is writing. Um, you're a Disney princess. <laughs> you're a writer. You're a chef. <laughs> I do I do too much. That's why I was so tired when I got here. But um, no, I'm a, I actually that's the first um, degree that I got from school was I was an English major with a minor in philosophy. And um, and then I went on to culinary school afterwards because I realized that I basically got a degree in basket weaving because nobody's hiring an English <laughs> philosophy major. There are no jobs that come out of that. Um, but because of that, I, I started a publishing house locally called Bent Pin Press. And we put out a book last year that was just called Issue Number One because it's going to be recurring. But it's an anthology of local writers because I'm really passionate about highlighting Caribbean writers, but more so Belizean writers, because every other country has a publication like that, where if you write, you can aspire to see your work published there. But 
Belize hasn't really. So if you're somebody who's passionate about reading and you want to get into writing or you've been writing as long as you can remember, it's sort of like, what do I do with this? You know, like maybe I can get into marketing. Maybe I can write captions for some company for their Instagram. But you you don't have that place to be like, this is something I can do something with. Yeah. So it's a talent that you tend to abandon and then just move on to a, some job that makes sense. But if you have a place to see your work published, um, I, I think that it, it makes people work harder because they know that they're not just doing it for themselves. And we had a really great turnout. And um, I think that it was just so... We, we worked really hard in getting the word out, and I think that we did such a good job that we got to publish. Um, I'm sure you know Becca Lam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, the, the daughter of, um, of Z Ejo, um, she actually reached out and she offered us the opportunity to publish an excerpt from her mother's book in our book nice and it's a i mean it's a legitimate book we have an isbn number it's at the library of congress in the united states it's um it's available online for sale most places but i'm gonna bring you a copy next time i see please you. do and, and i'll definitely i'll definitely reading i read it sorry i haven't done any type of reading in quite a while um social media consumes you and that's what i've fallen into uh consuming content to create content um writer's imagination is very bright yeah i'm pretty sure your imagination is super colorful like all the things that you do trigger that um but in my case my imagination is there but it's more on the, like graphics you know like pictures and 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 videos and and that's well because of i'm because i'm an influencer you know but um i want to um unlock that part of me with reading and i think reading is very powerful the only other book that I've ever read is the Bible. Um, it's a good book. It, it is a good um, um, history book, you know, and I and I really I, I really love reading the Bible and, and learning about the things that that happened back in the day. Are you religious? I am rediscovering my religion right now. Okay. Um, I was baptized Catholic. Okay. And then I went to Catholic school, and you know how what that can do to you. <laughs> what <laughs> I, I got, you know the stereotype about being traumatized by catholic school um so i think that made me move away from it a little bit but i um i'm actually the book that i'm reading right now is the apocrypha <laughs> oh that's cool the um for, for listeners that are not like super religious <laughs> the apocrypha is a collection of books that didn't pass the um what's it called the nicene um, council i believe canon yeah, yeah, where, the, they, where the, there was like a meeting where they selected yeah. what would be... I don't there know. were seven... Well, I, I don't think a lot of people know, but but I, I have a degree in theology. Oh, really? Yeah, I do have that a... That is so cool, yeah. dude. Yeah, I don't I don't always share it on social media because I have, very again, very unconventional uh, unconventional thoughts, sorry, um, about religion, but I have a, a degree in, in theology and people don't know how the 66 books in the Bible came about. And it was 70 priests who sat and said, well, we're going to... Put this book, when I put that book, when I put this book, when I put that book. And then the Catholic people were like, and we are put for you on one too. Yeah. Boom. And then that's in the, the, the extra books that 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 the um that the Catholic Bible has. And there are a lot of stories that are not included in in the evangelic Bible, but it but they make a lot of sense. Yeah. And certain and so some of them, you know, sighting of, of dragons and, 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 and wars with dragons and fights with them, it sounds science, like science fiction. But then you look at the Chinese um, culture. What do they have drawn on their walls? Dragons. Their whole culture. Oh no! I think dra dragons and giants don't get me started. They all existed. Yeah. But <laughs> so yeah. so these are things. These are things that people don't know about. Um, people don't know how the law of Moses worked, and when the the New Testament when after Jesus Christ died, um, and 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 the new laws that were made, and and well not new laws but certain things changed you know you no longer kill a sheep if you ask for forgiveness for your sins you need to repent from in here and, and ask god for forgiveness um you're no longer following the torah genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy those fi first five books considered the law of moses is what everyone used before jesus christ then after him a lot of things the changed new covenant. yeah, yeah the so new covenant. so it, it that is a that is a very very long long conversation and i've i love i love speaking to people about about religion um because it helps me to know where people stand mm -hmm. and how blind some people are by faith don't get me wrong there's certain things that just require you to have faith mm -hmm. but there are others that are based on facts 
And that's why beyond reading the Bible um, with faith, I always read it as a history book. That's I know. I noticed you said that when you first said that. I love it as a, as a history book. Um, I've actually also read the Bible. Um, I mentioned the Catholic school thing and my love of books. Um, I used to get in trouble quite a lot in class at SCA because I would be reading books under the table and they would take the books away from me when they'd catch me do it. Um, so I discovered this great life hack is that if you go to a Catholic school and you're reading the Bible under the table, they're not going to take it away from you. You get to keep reading your stories. So I ended up reading the entire Bible that way. And it, I think it surprised a lot of my religion teachers because as I mentioned, I, I had a troubled experience with religion when I was in Catholic school. Um, I think that I've, I've developed a better understanding of it um, from reading, like you said, and reading it that way. I think that the way that we learn about religion, especially in Catholic schools, which kind of, I don't think it makes sense actually that, I wanted to know why I, why these things, you know? They teach you the prayers first. They teach you the um, the acts of going through these. Like you go up the aisle and you, you, the actions you learn first and then it's not until you're older if you have the interest to look that you can actually learn, you know, like the stories behind it. You keep repeating the same stories in church every Sunday, you know, it's the same ones that you hear over and over. So it's so surprising when you open the Bible and you're like, wait, what? I didn't even know this name. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and to be honest with you, a lot of times you see churches turning into businesses as well. Um, it's crazy because it, it is happening a lot more now with social media. Um, I'm not for it. Like, like when I see um, a business, I'm sorry, a church turning into a business, I can easily tell. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to tell. But then again, a lot of people are, are, blind, are blinded by fit to the point that they just don't care. Whatever the pastor says goes. So mm -hmm. give pastor my money, um, which is fine. The Bible says that you need to give 10% of everything, but it doesn't only boil down to money. Um, that 10% per is also about your time. So yeah, you're giving that 10% one time every Sunday, but 10% of 365 days and a quarter in a year is 30, 36, almost 37 days. Are you assisting church? For 37 days we're talking about full 24 hours so do the maths are you really giving god that 10 percent? so you're being a hypocrite because then you had to give me your money or to give the pastor the money but you're not going to church and, and really worshiping god according to the bible and religion your purpose on earth is to worship god and that's what we were made for of course we have to survive so everything else comes about but people not see it now really. people they're like oh well the pastor said this that that that, that. boom they just just follow it. And it shouldn't be like that. Um, there are a lot of things that you're told, don't question it. Mm -hmm. Why? I question everything. The only thing I've never questioned is the existence of God. Because by faith, I know that a God exists. Um, and but, I mean, by logic, I mean, uh, there's no uncaused cause. <laughs> correct. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so it's just one of those things that people need to, to learn about a lot more. I believe that people need to also start learning about different religions and what you believe in and the books that you read. Um, and that is going to give me a better understanding on my one and why things happened. Um, and there's, not a lot, there's a lot of, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> there's a lot of synchronicities across all of the religions. I mean, I've seen suggestions that the, the Buddha was, a, was an apostle um, or vice versa, yeah. that, that Jesus had made it in his travels to the Eastern world and he met the Buddha because they would have been alive in, Arguably the same time, depending on what historical record you're looking at. I think that's the main thing. It's just um, is being able to think more broadly, but also at the same time not not get lost. Uh, I, I, somebody, somebody whose opinion I really respect said something to me about being able to allow conflicting ideas to coexist, and that that's something that he learned that really helped him a lot. Yeah. And that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, that just because two things... It's just like, like evolution. Yeah, it, it, can like, all, it can all be true. It can, it can all be true, yeah. um, and it can all interconnect. The Bible says that one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years for God is like one day. So who knows? Maybe, just maybe, evolution happened in 7,000 years. I don't know what's the probability, or what are the chances that that is actually true, but it can coexist, and these things... Um, you know, might have happened and they're all true, but they're just taken out, taken out of context. And some of them, um, by me not respecting people's faith, doesn't mean that I will not um, take the, the historical um, um, facts in the Bible. So let's say, for example, someone that doesn't believe in God, someone that's an atheist, 
and they don't read the Bible because, oh, I don't believe in a God. But don't forget that the Bible is also a piece of history mm -hmm. and it has history in it. So you can still look, read the Bible on a, on a, uh, from a history point of view. The Bible is written in three different dimensions, if I'm not mistaken. There's a spiritual one. You got to be a spiritual person to really understand certain parts of the Bible. There's the literal one, the one that you and I probably read, and that's as much as we can understand from it. And then there is a dimension where you need to learn how to understand parables and stories that never really happened. But these are just stories that are in the Bible to help you understand certain principles and, and what you should do and what you should not do. Um, moral beginnings. To, I'm totally, I, I don't know what your thought is about moral beginnings, but I'm against, um, I'm totally against parents using the Bible to teach moral beginnings. You know, it's not, it's not something that I've thought about too much. Um, I, I think that I, I, I mirror um, Dr. Julius Evola. <laughs> this is getting super esoteric. Um, but I, I mirror Dr. Julius Evola in terms of, I mean, the idea that regardless of if you believe in it in your heart in that way, where it's like this belief that's beyond yourself, or if you believe in the parables, the, at the end of the day, the, the traditional religions are what have guided us this long. And they are the things that inform any other kind of morality that you are looking at. Like maybe, I mean, you know, those the, the things that they teach in schools in the U.S. now that are just kindness and all of those things, they're all mentioned in the Bible. So, I mean, I think that you can teach it with or without the Bible. But I I mean, I don't know. I, that, I think that's a really good question. That's because a, that's because a put it this way, um, Sam, what about the people that don't believe in God and don't read the Bible? But there's no good, good people. They can do good. Yes, yes. No, I mean, if you need... If you need a book written, you know, like in the desert, like 3,000 years ago to be a good person, you're a bad person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so you can still be a good person without yeah. without that. Um, I think that moral beginnings are culturally instilled. Because in Scotland, for example, um, if I wear a skirt here for the religious people would be like, oh, that's wrong. Men should not be wearing skirts. That's the most masculine piece of clothing that you can wear in scotland exactly yeah. so so it varies because cloth. yeah so it's a it, it culturally instilled you know um but if it was plaid you know and had the i feel like it might read as a kilt i have a friend out here actually um shout out shout out bone he he frequently wears a kilt cool 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 i've never <laughs> yeah. seen anyone with it so with, really with a with tall, a kilt. tall dread guy always just rocking the kilt nice yeah. nice nice and and you know that that people need to understand that because one time I went to a village deep, deep down south and there's a Maya lady outside of her house chopping the yard. But she wasn't only chopping the yard. She never have on one shirt and it never got on any brassiere. So her boobs were just out flinging around and she's chopping the yard. Somehow when I looked at it, I, I, I didn't look at it sexually. I was like, hmm, they probably do this here a lot. So said, so done. A little bit further up, I saw another lady, and she had her boobs out. Um, she and had I, no tan lines. Yeah, so <laughs> like, they're like, like, and it was normal. Like, kids yeah. were around, and nobody cares. Again, culturally instilled. Everything boils down to, to what you were taught. Um, no, for example, I went to um, I went to a nude beach in Barcelona once. And, um, I mean, several times. So when I was in Barcelona, and all of the beaches are nude beaches. So, And it's just, it's so normal. There's nobody just gawking. Because that's how that's how they're raised. The human body isn't intrinsically sexual. It's not sexual, even if it's completely nude, unless it is behaving sexually. And I mean, that's a that's a that's a huge thing, right? I mean, that's um, that the sculptures aren't like you can you can look at nudity in art. Yeah. And you don't consider that to be vulgar. No. It's not. It's not pornographic. It's mm -hmm. not. But you have to be able to tell the difference between a painted nude of David and pornography. And something that I wanted to bring up when you were talking about um, just the way people read the Bible is that it's something that I've been learning a lot about. Is that there's just very, very seriously a bell curve when it comes to people's IQs. And the people up here, you know, most people are up here at the top. A very small percentage are down here on the right side that are like super geniuses. But there's actually quite a bit of people who are over here on the left side of the bell curve that are just not capable of that thought process. There's um there's a thought experiment that I saw online that I thought was really interesting. And it's if you um if you ask somebody, like for example, Ben, if you didn't eat breakfast yesterday, how would you feel? Empty and hungry. 
Okay, so you at least are above a 90 IQ. Some people can't answer that question. And I, I know that that blows your mind, but try it when you meet people now. Really? Yes. They'll be like, well, I don't know because I did eat breakfast. They're not capable of... Well, I've, I've been there before. I, I've, I've, yeah, there have been some days that I, that I wasn't able to have breakfast, so I, was like, I can relate. But uh, you're right. If it, if, if it had never happened to you and you had to think about it, it's like... A lot of people can't do that. A lot of people can't just like immediately manifest that thing. It's like if, if it was not experienced, it's like, what do you mean if I didn't eat? I did eat breakfast. As opposed to, well, I can imagine that if I didn't eat, then I would be really hungry. Yeah. Some people can't make that leap. To, and it's, I forget the word for it, but it's something about, um, it's not lateral thinking. It, it's something like that. But I think about that a lot now when, I, I, when I'm interacting with people, that it's just you have to recognize that whether it's because of, um, you know, like how you were brought up, your availability to education or just, you know, genetics. Yeah. Some people are, low, are on the left side. <laughs> Listen, I think, I think it's a balance. I think we need everyone, yeah. you know. Every, yes. I think everyone is it, okay, you know. Like I, I'm, I'm a sole believer that everyone has a superpower. Um, not literal superpowers, yeah. but like you have that thing that nobody can do better than you. Like that's Samantha's thing. Like you don't you, need to be a supercomputer you know? to be valuable in society. Yeah. It's just the reality is that some people are supercomputers and some people are And you'd be, and you'd be surprised that a lot of the, the public figures and a lot of people out there that are seen as role models sometimes don't even have anything that special. You know, like if, if you hear them speak or if, when you meet them, you realize that they're as regular as you can get as regular as you are and until you meet them then you realize oh shit you know it may like normal yeah. you know um and again it's because people have that like oh you know probably he's smarter or or oh, because somebody's super rich billionaires for example yeah they're smart they're hardworking and what's not but that doesn't mean you can't do it in an ideal world um where everyone works hard you would you would be able to have your own money as well if everyone were entrepreneurs we wouldn't be able to coexist because then I got my business, you got your business. So like there's the the consumer, you know, like (laughs) it it would be different. So we need everybody. We need the consumers. We need the capitalists. We need the the socialists. We need everybody. Like, I think that it's all a balance. Have you seen the movie A Day Without a Mexican? No. Great movie. Go home and watch it. What? A Day Without a Mexican. It's, um, I don't know if it's a big movie or not, but I know that my dad was always a big fan of it. So I've seen it quite a few times. But it's essentially just um, one day, every Latino in the U.S. disappears. Damn. That's the whole movie. <laughs> so, 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 so you watch like just the country fall apart. Yeah. Is like there's no like there's nobody pick, there's nobody picking the 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 produce there's nobody like just all of the smaller jobs that upper class Americans don't want to do. The blue collar jobs, yeah. Not even like I mean because it's, there are there are jobs that you can't even call blue collar jobs. Worse uh, than blue collar, yeah. Well, lower than blue collar. And that's, yeah, yeah. Which I don't want to say worse because there's no bad job. It's yeah, everybody yeah. needs money, but they're just those jobs that are just completely undesirable to to Americans, even if they're poorer Americans. You know, because the the difference I, I've I've heard it said many times that the difference between um, a poor black man and a poor white man in the United States is that a poor white man doesn't think that he should be in that position. <laughs> Yeah, and he he considers he, he considers himself to be faulted. And then the black guy just he's accepts like, his reality, he's and like, he's this like, "This is eh. what it is." The white guy thinks that there's something is owed to me, and that it's just like one one th- I'm one thing away from all of this. And it's not it's not necessarily to say that it's true. It's just that that's how that's how he thinks that he aligns himself more with his people who looks like him. And would still vote that way, even if there's, and that's, I mean, that's why poor whites vote Republican, and even though it doesn't benefit them in the United States, <laughs> because they they think that they're just one one step away from everybody else. Yeah. Even though they're not, and it, it's funny stuff. It's class stuff. It comes back to representation. Everybody yeah, just like yeah. they see themselves in somebody. Again, else. culture, yeah. culture as well, and and what what is instilled in you. It's it's crazy it's how tribalism. It's tribalism. It's, it's crazy <laughs> how how powerful it is because it it can either make you or destroy you for the rest of your life when you when you think that you should not be in that position so you excel or when you accept the reality and be like fuck it i'll stay here then and then you don't excel bootstraps then yeah. that's Oops. it yeah. sam it was an absolute honor to have you here we've had a wonderful time and any last words for us i think after that heavy theological conversation as much as i enjoyed it i am itching for a traveler's <laughs>